Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, the Monday show in which we run down all the launches that happened over the last seven days and what we have to look forward to over the coming week. Without further ado, let's get right into it and talk about all the stuff that happened last week. Our first launch from last week was the Ariane Space Vega Flight VV-16, which launched on September the 2nd. I wasn't sure if this launch was going to go ahead as it was initially postponed due to the storm track of Typhoon Maysak over South Korea. Luckily, however, the proof of concept flight did eventually launch, successfully inserting a mixture of 50 microsatellites, nanosatellites and CubeSats into orbit. These satellites were sent into orbit for a whopping 21 customers, so Ariane Space has definitely made a lot of people very happy indeed. We at Space This Week are very excited for Ariane Space's bright future. Next up, also on September the 2nd, we had the test fire for the SLS Mega Rocket Booster ahead of the Artemis 3 mission planned for 2024. The first flight for the SLS, Artemis 1, is planned for November 2021. This will be an uncrewed mission that will send an Orion spacecraft around the moon. The SLS development is now expected to cost a cool $9.1 billion, which is much more than the initial baseline of $7 billion, and that figure could rise even more if Artemis 1 is delayed again. At least this test has put us one step closer to the November 2021 deadline, which will hopefully keep us on track for the epic Artemis program. Next up, we saw the latest batch of Starlink satellites deployed. The next 60 satellites for SpaceX's mega constellation flew into space aboard a Falcon 9 rocket on September the 3rd, bringing the total number of Starlink sats in orbit to over 700. I never get tired of seeing Starlink launches, and to be honest, it's a good job I don't, as there could be up to 12,000 satellites needed to meet Musk's goal of global high-speed internet coverage. Cheers, Elon. Here's to another successful mission and to the next 100 launches. It's time for some Starship news. Finally saving the best until last, we got to see the Starship SN6 150-meter hop on the 3rd of September. It was, of course, supposed to launch on the 30th of August, but it was cancelled due to the weather, apparently. However, ladies and gentlemen, as the hop was cancelled, the backup road closures of August the 31st and September the 1st were suspiciously withdrawn. New road closures were then announced for the 3rd, with backup dates on the 4th and the 5th. This does suggest that there may have been some sort of issue that needed fixing, possibly an issue with the Raptor, but really this is just speculation. You never know, maybe Elon was just really determined to hop the SN6 on the same day as the Starlink launch. It doesn't matter why the launch was scrubbed really, because the flight went ahead and it was so exciting and so epic to watch another grain silo jump into the sky and land again in a cloud of smoke. I was watching the launch on Everyday Astronaut stream and the suspense was killing everyone before liftoff. What an amazing time for SpaceX. We're now one step closer to seeing the company's silver monster fly into Earth orbit in what will be one of the most historic space flights of the millennium. In other Starship news, the tank pressure test for the SN7.1 that was planned for the 6th didn't go ahead. We have backup dates for tonight and tomorrow, so watch this space and keep your fingers and your toes crossed. It was intended to test the tank pressure to destruction to hopefully achieve a higher tank failure pressure than what was achieved with the SN7. The SN7, of course, being constructed of the same 304L stainless steel that the Starship SN8 will be made from. And that's everything we got to see over the past seven days. But let's now look at what lies over the next week. This week, we will have the test flight for Astra's Rocket 3.1. This is their first ever orbital attempt with their sleek new Rocket 3.1 launcher. And because of this, it won't carry a payload. It is very much just a test of the vehicle itself. Instead, the vehicle will send an electronic signal to mimic satellite deployment. I love this rocket. I have to talk about it a lot because the launch keeps on getting scrubbed, but I guess there's just part of me that's really rooting for the little guy. The next launch window will open on September the 10th, and I have a really good feeling about this one. I just have a deep faith that it'll definitely launch this week. I can feel it 
in my bones. Obviously, I have no real way of knowing, so tune in next week to see if we finally got to see the little guy fly. And uh, that's actually the only confirmed launch for this week. There may be some other launches confirmed later on, though. Some sources say that we may see another Starlink mission next week, and we may also see Rocket Lab's launch of a US Space Force satellite next week. So tune into next Monday's episode to see if any of those launches went ahead. The mighty Delta IV Heavy may also get a new launch date fairly soon, which is definitely one to watch out for. In the sky this week, we will get to see Venus reach its highest point in the morning sky on the 8th of September. The Epsilon Perseids meteor shower will peak on the 9th, producing up to 5 meteors per hour. And finally, Neptune will be at opposition on the 11th of September and will be visible for most of the night. The dates do of course vary slightly depending on where you are in the world, but be sure to keep a lookout on the night sky this week. We've got some cool stars and you may even see a shooting star or two if you're lucky. But now it's time to move along to my favourite part of the show, in which we look at all the cool stuff that happened this week throughout space history. To kick things off, tomorrow on September the 8th, we will be able to celebrate the anniversary of the premiere of the first ever Star Trek episode, The Man Trap. This is one of the most groundbreaking television shows of all time, and I'm sure it needs no introduction on this channel, and it's one of the staple works in the world of science fiction. While not strictly spaceflight history, I imagine that many viewers of my channel are fans of Star Trek, so I felt it would be worth including its anniversary in this week's history segment. The same day, in 2004, NASA's unmanned spacecraft Genesis crash-landed in Utah after its drogue chute failed to deploy. This was particularly alarming as the Genesis was a sample return probe that had gathered a sample of solar wind particles, the first NASA return mission to bring back material since the Apollo missions, and the first ever to return material from beyond the moon's orbit. While the crash contaminated many of the sample collectors, some survived and the Genesis science team found that some of the contamination from the crash could be removed or avoided and that the samples could be analysed after all. Thus, the mission ended up achieving all of its major science objectives. Phew. Twelve years later, in 2016, September the 8th saw the launch of another sample return mission. This was of course the OSIRIS-REx mission and will be NASA's first asteroid sample return mission. The probe is currently orbiting the asteroid 101955 Bennu, <laughs> and NASA plans to perform the first sampling on the 20th of October this year. So we'll hopefully be able to talk about the success of this in an upcoming Space This Week episode. The probe is expected to return to Earth with samples in 2023. The next day, on September the 9th, we'll be able to celebrate the anniversary of the discovery of Amalthea, which was the fifth moon of Jupiter discovered and was spotted by Edward Emerson Barnard in 1892. It is the largest of the inner satellites of Jupiter and was the last natural satellite to be discovered by direct visual observation. All later moons were discovered by photographic or digital imaging. Slightly more recently, on September the 9th, 2012, the Indian Space Agency put its heaviest foreign satellite yet into orbit, in a streak of 21 successful launches of its Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, or PSLV, rocket. A brilliant medium lift launch system that currently holds the record for most satellites deployed in a single launch after it inserted 104 satellites into sun-synchronous orbit in early 2017. I feel like these sorts of shows tend to focus a lot on US and Russian rockets, so it's cool to be able to talk about a rocket that might not be quite so well known among my audience. A couple of days later, on the 11th of September in 1997, NASA's Mars Global Surveyor arrived at the Red Planet, where it would complete a 22-minute insertion burn to place itself in a highly elliptical 45-hour orbit. In a very Kerbal move, the spacecraft then spent a year and a half performing aerobrake maneuvers to shrink its orbit down to a high point of 450 kilometers, which at this altitude meant that the surveyor circled Mars once every two hours. It went on to perform a thorough analysis of the entire Martian surface, atmosphere, and interior. It would provide us with a wealth of fascinating information about Mars and helped pave the way for future Mars landers and rovers by identifying potential landing sites and relaying surface telemetry data. Sadly, the mission came to an end when the spacecraft failed to respond to commands on the 2nd of November 2006. 
One last tragic faint signal was detected three days later that indicated that the craft had gone into safe mode. Attempts to recontact were unsuccessful, and the mission was officially terminated in January 2007. The next day, September the 12th in 1959 this time, the Soviet Union launched the large Lunik 2 rocket at the moon. It was shot at the moon on a direct path, sending back telemetry data to Earth, and it released a sodium gas cloud so that its movements could be visually observed as well. It smashed into the moon the next day on the 13th of September, becoming the first spacecraft to reach the surface of the moon, and by extension the first human-made object to make contact with another celestial body. The probe was searching for lunar magnetic and radiation fields similar to the Earth's Van Allen radiation belts. While it didn't detect any radiation belts around the moon before impact, it did measure a change in ion particle flux, which suggested the presence of an ionosphere. The same day, in 1966, the penultimate Gemini mission, the Gemini 11, was launched. During the flight, the astronauts Charles Conrad Jr. and Richard Gordon Jr. performed the first ever direct ascent rendezvous with an Agena target vehicle in order to simulate a lunar module rendezvous with a command module after a moon landing, which of course the Gemini missions were precursors to. The craft then used the Agena craft to raise its orbit to a world record apoapsis height and created a small amount of artificial gravity by spinning the two spacecraft connected by a tether. Gordon also performed two EVAs for a total of 2 hours and 41 minutes. To this day, only the Apollo missions have exceeded the altitude set by Gemini 11. Finally, for September the 12th, we had the launch of STS-47, which was the 50th Space Shuttle mission ever. The vehicle to make this historic flight was Space Shuttle Endeavour, which carried May Carol Jemison, the first African-American woman in space, Mamoru Mori, the first Japanese citizen to fly in a US spaceship, and Mark Lee and Jan Davis, the first married couple in space. The mission used the Space Shuttle's Space Lab module to conduct microgravity investigations in materials and life sciences. And so concludes this week's rundown of all the stuff that happened in space throughout history this week. And that about wraps things up for this week's episode of Space This Week. I do hope you enjoyed today's episode. Let us know down below which mission you're most excited to see over the next seven days. I'll be signing off right now, but I'll leave you with an end screen. On the left is a link to the full Space This Week playlist, and on the right is a video from my channel that YouTube's recommendation bots think you'll like. Hopefully they made a good choice. Anyway, goodbye, and thank you so much for watching.